and things. And now what I'd like to do is look at parables and talk a little bit about what is a parable and how do you interpret parable stories. And we've, we've seen them in Matthew chapter 13, also in Matthew chapter 25, um, and, and now in Luke we see 17 unique parables, totally unique just to Luke. So why did Jesus use parables? Well, we're not left to our imagination. Jesus actually tells us why he uses parables. In Mark chapter 4, verse 12, he says this, When he was alone, the twelve and others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that, and then he quotes, he says, so that they may be ever seeing and never perceiving. So they're going to be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. So they're going to hear the parable, but they're not going to understand what it is. And Jesus says he purposely speaks in parables so there's this obfuscation thing where they'll hear, but they won't understand. And otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And actually what Jesus is doing there, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and following, where Isaiah, in the receiving of his call, with those seraphims flying around God with their six wings and saying, glory, to glory, you know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, that kind of thing, these seraphim and this holiness of God. And Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And God then takes the coal and, and says, you know, and makes him clean. And then basically God commissions him. And this is the great commissioning of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, that basically you're going to call out Isaiah and you're going to prophesy, but those people aren't going to understand. You're going to show them things they're not going to be able to see what you're showing them. And Jesus then participates Basically, what this is saying is that Jesus is participating in the prophetic tradition, that Jesus is the prophet who is going to participate in this, this prophetic tradition of, of speaking and not being understood, and he knows that. And so this is the, um, you know, the function of the parables, to kind of reveal and to conceal at the same time. So the, the parables reveal and conceal at the same time. And uh, now, there's... Four different types of parables. For those that have uh, studied parables, uh, there's uh, four different types. Um, the first is what's called a simile. And all the parables are built on almost a metaphorical way of thinking. What is a metaphor? A metaphor is when you have one domain and you have another semantic domain. And so you say, he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. Well, you're talking about a human being. How is a human being like a tree? Well, he brings forth fruit in his season, and his leaf will not wither, and whatsoever he does prospers. And so a, a person is like a tree, and so it's metaphorical. You've got a person here, and you've got a tree here, and it's, they're related then in this metaphorical way. A parable is kind of like that. So a simile parable is the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. A mustard seed is, you know, one of the smallest seeds. You put it in the ground, it grows up to be a big tree, and the birds come and the branches, and this, this big plant from the little, little seed of the, of the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like that. Starts small, gets big. And so the kingdom of heaven is like, and that like or as, when you do like or as, he shall be like a tree, that's called a simile. It's a particular type of metaphorical thinking. Simile, like or as, using like or as. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Okay, so that would be, and those, the simile type, usually short, very almost one liners, and that too shall be like a mustard seed. Now, second type is an example story. An example story is where the kind of the message of the parable is okay, now I'm going to tell you a story. When I'm done the story, go out and do likewise. In other words, Take the hero of the story, and you do the same thing he did. Okay? Take the hero of the story, go and do likewise. So he says, I'm going to tell you a story. The story is going to be over here, but I'm really talking about you and using this parable as an example, as a, as a model. As, and so an example of an example story would be the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan comes. This guy gets beat up. He's uh, laying on the road. And a priest walks by, and the priest says, hey, you know, this guy's unclean, walks by on the other side. A Levite comes by, a teacher, one who teaches the law in Israel. He comes by, sees this guy that's been beat up. He passes by on the other side. So they all kind of pass by on the other side. 
finally, a dirty, scuzzy Samaritan comes, who's like a half-breed, no-good-for-nothing person comes. A Samaritan, a dirty, stinking Samaritan comes by. The Samaritan looks at the person who's been beat up, and the Samaritan has compassion, and so he is the good Samaritan. He takes the person, bandages his wounds, takes him to the inn, tells the innkeeper, you take care of him, I'll pay you what, uh, whatever it costs, I'll come back and pay you uh, once he's healed up and is able to go. The parable of the Good Samaritan ends then. Basically, what's the message? Well, well, we'll look at this a little bit later, but it just, and, but, you know, what does it mean to be a neighbor? And this guy is it a neighbor to this guy. And so go and do likewise. You should be like the Samaritan and have compassion on those who are in need. So the, the Good Samaritan story is an example story. Go be like the Samaritan. Do like he did. Now, um, there's a parable, what I would call a parable proper. And a parable proper, proper has this, uh, it, it's a story. It tells a story, and it may not be um, an example that you go do likewise, but it tells a story where it tells something about the kingdom of heaven or something, the kingdom of God. So, for example, a, a guy goes out and he has a wedding feast, and he's inviting everybody to come to his wedding feast, but they all return the RSVPs, come back, no, we don't want to go to your wedding feast and we don't want to come. So what he does is he says, hey, go out into the highways and byways, find people and bring them in to the wedding feast. So it's telling us something that the kingdom of heaven is like this wedding feast, and the, this son is getting married, and therefore invite everybody in. And then a guy comes in with the, doesn't, isn't dressed properly, and they throw him out and things. And so this isn't a go and do likewise kind of parable. Okay, This is not a go and do likewise. This is telling us something about the kingdom of heaven, that there's going to be this invitation that goes out to everybody, but the people are going to reject it. And he's going to go out into the highways and byways, the ones that are the homeless people, the people that are no good for, you know, they're going to bring those people in, and those people are the ones that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven rather than those, the guests who were invited. And so that would be a typical parable story. It's not something where you go out and, and do it yourself, but it's, it tells something about the nature of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So, and then lastly, there's this allegory type and the allegory type and the parable type are close. The, the allegory type, though, I think is, is more, um, and actually the one that I'd probably like to use with that is uh, act, or Luke chapter 8, which is paralleled over in the uh, Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the seeds, where basically a farmer goes out and he's casting his seeds. And as he's casting his seeds, basically you've got four scenarios developed, and that's what an allegory Allegory means that there's not just one story that's coming to, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like this guy with the, and it goes all toward the, the how do you enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, these other parables are very much focused on one point. The allegory uh, parable will actually have four different things that it's communicating here. So the guy throws some seed falls on the, on the path. When it falls on the path, nothing happens to it because the birds come and snatch it away. Well, later Jesus tells them the bird snatching away is Satan. The evil one comes and snatches before the word of God can penetrate their heart. Before they even hear the word of God, boom, it's, they're on the hard path. The bird snatches, the, so it doesn't even get to grow at all. So that's the first type of, of seed, or soil. And actually, a lot of people said the parable of the sower is better called the parable of the soils because there's four different types of soils. So some falls on the path, the bird snatches it away, the evil one snatches it away. Other falls on a rock, on rocky soil. And so with rocky soil, what's the problem with rocky soil? You've got a little bit of soil, and you've got rocks underneath, so there's not enough for the roots. So basically when the sun comes up and it burns, it burns it off, and there's no, root, there's no depth of root that this plant can get its moisture, and so the plants die. Okay, They receive the word. These are those that receive the word and it's a good thing, they receive it with joy. But when troubles come, when troubles come, then they can't handle it. The sun comes down and beats on them, they wilt and wither and die. Okay, So they receive the word with joy, and then they die because they don't have any roots. And, um, and so that would, be the second, that would be the second type of soil then, the one in the rocky soil. And then you're familiar with the parable. And then some falls among the weeds and thorns, and it grows up and things, and it receives, and it's life, it comes alive. But, but basically the thorns and the weeds choke it out and kill it off. That's a third type. And he says basically the thorns and the, the weeds and things are the, 
are the, the deceitfulness of riches, the, the longing for things in this life, and the things of this world, the, the lust of the eyes, the, the pride of life, and the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, and the things of this world drowned it out. And so basically the message is, is killed off and choked out by the weeds and thorns of, of the pleasantries of this world. Um, sidetrack the person to go away from the kingdom of God. And then finally, the fourth type of soil then is that the farmer casts the soil and some of it hits on good, good soil. There's not the weeds there and stuff and the thing produces what, 60, 80, 100 times what it was and that hits on the good soil. And what he's saying is that's, you know, that's, you, you know, you, you want to be the good soil. And so you've got the four different types of soil. That's why it's an allegory. Uh, it isn't a full-blown allegory. When I say allegory, you probably think of things like uh, Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, or you think of C.S. Lewis' Chronicles of Narnia or something like that, or, or um, uh, Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings or something, where there's a story told that uh, has many, many faceted. This is a parable story that's an allegory. So there's four different types of soil. So it's not singular, it's, it's manifold in terms of this thing. Now, there's several things then. So these are what the parables are like. Again, they're metaphorical at their root. And they're, they're taken as simple uh, example stories, parable stories of the kingdom or whatever, and then allegory stories where there's actually multiple facets to this and things. Um, now, a couple things here. Um, when I originally, I took a whole course in parables once, and um, the parables were said to be very common stories. A sower goes out to sow seed. That happens all the time. So they're very common things that happen all the time. And so, but I, I think one of the things missing in that discussion, I think, is that the parables um, actually a lot of times are hyperbolic. They're hyperbolic they're exaggerated stories. And you need to understand that these things are exaggerated. They're stories. And when people tell stories, do they, are stories always historically accurate? Well, you're not always telling the, the story to be historically accurate. Sometimes you're trying to make a point. So you purposely exaggerate certain things in the story to make the point that, of why you're telling the point to this audience. So you've got an audience and you've got a storyteller. The storyteller then crafts his story according to the audience. Uh, we've got a guy here at Gordon College that talks about Dr. Graham Bird, who plays jazz. Uh, he does jazz piano. He's a phenomenal pianist, as well as a phenomenal linguist and many other things, computer expert and various things. And he talks about that when he plays jazz, he'll do something like the Amazing Grace, okay, and he'll just he'll play Amazing Grace, and then all of a sudden he'll say, okay, now watch this. If he's got an audience that's uh, classical, and Gordon College people are more classical, highbrow types of things, all of a sudden Graham will play Amazing Grace in, in a classical style, a Beethoven or something like that. And you'll know, you can recognize it, it's a totally different way of playing it, but yet it's still Amazing Grace. You can hear the tune. And then then he comes in a more gospel church setting, and all of a sudden then he'll play uh, Amazing Grace in a, in a gospel setting. And uh, so you get that kind of thing, and he'll play as, you know, kind of like it would you'd hear in church and things. And then he also specializes in jazz and other things like that. And so all of a sudden you get this, uh, this jazz version of Amazing Grace going almost like you're down in Louisiana. And so it's, uh, it's uh, kind of an amazing thing. And, and you see, it's always, it's always amazing grace, but it's played. And so the story gets told in different ways with different audiences. And anybody who's tell, told stories uh, realizes this, okay? You, you have one audience, it's told one way, another, another way. And so this is, uh, you know, so hyperbole is used. Now you say, well, give me an example of what you're actually talking about here. Um, let me just use the parable of the wicked tenants. Or actually, we could use, let me use two parables. One is a guy owes somebody $10 million. And I think they say 10,000 talents. It's like $10 million. Okay, so this guy owes this guy 10,000 tablets. He owes talents. And he owes him like $10 million. And he comes to his master, please forgive me, please forgive me. And the master says, okay, you can go away, I forgive you. Now, the guy that was forgiven the $10 million has somebody that owes him 10 bucks. And he goes to the guy that owes him 10 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever it is and throws them in prison until he can pay everything. 
And so then the master calls back and says, hey, man, I forgave you $10 million. What did you do to this person? You know, and it just shows. And so the $10 million, you know, how many people really have $10 million? It's an exaggeration between the $10 million and the and the hundred dollars, and it's 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 purposely exaggerated, and that's called the hyperbolic way of thinking, where you where you 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 overemphasize something to show show the separation to make the point of your story, and uh, we we all do that kind of a thing. When I say we all do that, that itself is a hyperbole. Okay, a hyperbole is you know we say all, but not every person never does this kind of thing, and 